I think we should start now. I want to uh, start with thanking 57 people that are on the line right now with us. And um, I want to welcome all those people from all over the country that are joining us from North Carolina, New York, California, Illinois, Florida, uh, and besides Missouri. So we're excited to have you here. Um, I'm Patty Wincy. I'm the CEO of the International Photography Hall. Today, today's lecture is Chasing the Light, a Fireside Chat with Jack Graham. And um, if you are having problems, the next slide, please. If you're having, um, uh, Jack, could you the next slide? Um, uh, we, if you're having any technical problems, I'm gonna ask that you call 535-1999 for assistance. Um, keep your microphones off during this lecture. And uh, for questions at the end of this lecture, please go down to the chat function to, te to chat text um, a question to to Jack. The next slide we have is uh, important to have our sponsors of today, uh, today's lecture and that and the virtual series, which is Collins and Herman, the Regional Arts Council and Emerson. And I'd like to introduce uh, Jack Coran. And for those of you who have never seen him before, the next slide shows him in a somewhere wonderful, a little bit about me. <laughs> Jack's photography has been exhibited in Paris, Athens, Berlin, Moscow, Spain, and uh, in the U.S. Most recently, Jack has won numerous gold, silver, and bronze international awards. Taught out of uh, the out of the Yosemite conference, along with several assistants, including John Sexton and Alan Ross. You might say that there was a natural collision of circumstances between Jack's nearly uh, lifelong love of nature and that of photography. His wondrous journey into nature began when he attended an outward bound month long wilderness course at age 16. Who knows about those things? <laughs> at 18 and, and over 40 years ago, he picked up his first camera, developed his first black and white print in the dark room, and quickly put his. One of Jack's most essential beliefs is that we all need to give back. As, as such, you can visit Jack's YouTube channels where he shares his short, form free video tutorials. Yeah. white process in Adobe Lightroom. Without any further ado, the first 45 minutes of this hour are going to be dedicated to Jack's lecture. The last 15 minutes are going to be dedicated to questions that he will be receiving by chat room and he will be addressing them. Again, please keep your microphones uh, muted and off during this presentation. Um, as we have seen people on and we have um, a few registrants, others will be joining. Jack, thank you for being with us today. It's all yours. Thank you. Do I show up on video too besides the presentation? See the slideshow. Okay, great. So I can, I can do whatever. Um, so I have to qualify that photo real quick. Um, I was in Patagonia coming out of 60 mile an hour winds after shooting a sunset shot over a river gorge. So <laughs> that is my happy place. Anyway, um, I'm really looking forward to talking to everybody today and sharing some of my, my work and my images, telling you a little bit about uh, how I think, what, how I kind of got to where I am right now. Um, and, and then throughout the presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, my start, where I, where I started and why I started. And then I'm going to go through a little bit about how I've evolved because, you know, I, even today I'm evolving more than I have in the last 15 years in the last two years. So, and I've been shooting now for close to uh, 43 years. You know, I started with an intro to black and white photography course at a little small college, a little private college, and there was a National Geographic photographer who was retired there. And when I did my first print in the developer, um, I was just amazed and knew that I could almost never, ever get bored with photography. So I've passionately pursued it ever since. So let me just, um, let me get into a little bit about how I think about my evolution in photography. And then we'll get into some images that kind of talk about that. But for me, um, you know, you always hear about vision and having your own vision and, and for me, it's really something that's happened over the last um, really 
10 to 15 years. So if you think about the first 30 years, it's like all I did was go out and I shot pictures that made me feel good, but I really wasn't pushing the envelope to where I was feeling like I was creating something a little bit more dynamic and personal. And I think that's where imagination came in. I always had passion. So, if, you know, at the end of this, you can almost think about this in reverse. I had the passion. I started to have the imagination and eventually a vision of, evolved. So let me just kind of share with you um, how that works. So the ability to think about or plan the future with imagination or wisdom. Well, you know, the truth is this was really hard for me. When I first started in photography, I would go out and I would look at a lot of other photographers' work. And, and once I got it technically um, competent enough to where I could almost copy it, that's what I did. And I took a 4x5 camera. I traveled out west all the time. And I was copying some of the masters. And, you know, just real quickly, let me share with you what I'm talking about. And here are some examples of other people's vision executed by me. So Half Dome in Yosemite, that's Ansel Adams' famous shot. That's my version. <laughs> so I climbed all the way up to the diving board, a 16-mile hike, got up there, was totally exhausted, looked up, and I said, well, yes, that's actually been done before and done very well. I shot it, and I've never published this photograph, and I probably never will. But it's, it's here to serve the point of, you know, you can go out and you can stand in the exact same place as the person before you and you can technically get almost the exact same thing. So is there any individuality in there? Is there any of my personality? You know, if I posted that, everybody would think it was Ansel Adams. Here's another example. You know, this is an Edward Weston nude, nude out on the dunes. And then here's one that I did. And so they're very similar in their approach, their style, their thought process. One more, you know, here is the Maroon Bells in Colorado. And I just picked this up when I looked up Maroon Bells. There was a million of them that looked like this. And then there's mine. And it's like, okay, so I'm not really doing anything that has a lot of personal vision. So I, I began to think about this more and more, and, and, you know, I went and showed prints to Bob Kohlbrenner when I was a young guy, and, and he told me that I printed really dark and that everything I do looked dark and that I needed to kind of do the, the, um, the zone system and I needed to technically dodge this and technically burn this and, and get it to where all the zones represented a scene uh, that was in front of the camera. Well... You know, I eventually got to the point where I didn't feel that way. And so I found this quote that I think is really important for me. And that is, photography is the art of observation. It's about finding something interesting in an ordinary place. I found it has little to do with the things you see and everything to do with the way you see them. And this is by Elliot Erwitt. Um, and I really love this quote because it helped, for me, it helped define it's time to think a little differently. So let me just take you through a few things here. You know, how do we go to these places and create something new? If I go back to Yosemite, I was there in January and February shooting, and you, you, you drive around and you just see these iconic things that are always, you know, it, it, it's hard to imagine that you could shoot something different that hasn't been done by the masters that have been there before, and especially Ansel Adams. And so I'm going to share a couple of in, images here. Um, that I think are a little bit different. I don't think that Ansel would have technically shot these the same way. And this is Valley View in Yosemite. And here is the, the raw file, which I shot at about 6.30, um, really dark. And then when I went to process it, you can see now I have, I have the, the difference between the moving clouds and the iconic granite walls. So for me, it's, it's a different approach. And so then I started shooting in the park and I started shooting a lot of things more focused on motion than the solidified granite walls that are, that are just so iconic. And I look at things and I look at it my way, which is, you know, here's another raw file. And then it's like, what do I view this could be? 
So it's it's like what Elliot Erwood said. It's like what you imagine it could be. So now I start using imagination as opposed to just technically, um, you know, creating zone systems and things like that exactly the same. You know, a waterfall. But I tend to be really dark. And I think for me, it's a little bit more of an emotional place. Again, another shot in, in uh, Yosemite of El Capitan. But then again, it's a, it's a different approach to the traditional zone system. And one more, which is a little bit closer, but you'll notice that the clouds and stuff like that are all in motion. So I have this, this feeling of looking at images, and especially when there's something as solid as El Capitan, I just I look at the clouds and I'm like, I just have to capture the motion of this against the, the long term, you know, this wall is not moving. So let's talk a little bit about imagination and the faculty or action of forming new ideas or images or concepts of external objects not present to the senses. So this is where, you know, um, if you looked at this, the second image of Bridal Veil Falls, the, you would think, okay, it, it was a lot flatter. It was not quite like what I saw in that raw file. But when I got in there and I started dodging and burning, I started to create things that are different, uh, that the senses would react to differently. So if I share with you, this is a shot that I did out in Death Valley, and this is the raw file. I was out in the in the in the uh, the kind of the plateau where every once in a while it fills up with just an inch or two of water, and I was walking out here. And as I was walking back from shooting reflections in the water, I saw these footsteps, and it was really interesting because I turned around and I looked at my own footsteps, and I was. I was actually getting a little bothered by it. It's like, am I am I doing the same thing? Am I walking in this environment and, you know, kind of interfering with what's going on? And then I started seeing these footsteps go off into the distance and I really started thinking, where is that going? What what kind of who was that? Where did they go? Did they make it? You're in a place called Death Valley. So, you know, I interpreted the image like this which to me is a little bit more dynamic and really focuses on that walk. So let me share another one. This is the Alabama Hills, and you can just barely see some wispy clouds in the top. Well, I was really doing long exposure, and I had, I don't know, I think something like 30-second exposures, and so the intent when I was done was to be right here. Looking at the light in the foreground, adding more depth to it, looking and and I'm going to share some some things that I do when I'm out in the field and thinking on on my process, which is transitions in light and how light flows through scenes and stuff like that. Now I'll, I'll share that with you guys in a minute. You know, here's another one from Mesquite Dunes. I had this pre-visualized idea of getting out to the Mesquite Dunes, getting this really high contrast ripply dunes and, and I get there and it rains for three days and so I had high winds and rain and I'm like I was just so disappointed and then I I'm out I walk out here at you know 5 30 in the morning I get in probably two three miles into the dunes and I just start seeing this soft light come in through the through the sunrise to the right and I'm sitting here looking I can just you know it's so dark really that you know that the camera can open up the light a little bit more than the eye at this point, and and I can just barely see the texture, and I'm like, I don't th I don't think I can get it. So I really went into my my post processing and started dodging and burning, and got it to here. So this is where I was started to, to look at the scene and think, I know that I can make the contrast pop out of here and really get this to to come alive. And then you can see where the sun, you know, there's there's atmosphere in the background. You can still see where the rain's coming down on the left. Um, truth of the matter is about about uh, a minute and a half, two minutes later, I was looking through my camera to the left, and I don't have this image here, but I was looking at the, 
the clouds through, through a telephoto, and I'm like, boy, those are just awesome. And, and about two minutes later, I had a 60-mile-an-hour wind hit me in the face. Those clouds were sand, filled up my camera bag to the top with sand. Um, an hour later, none of my cameras worked, and I had to drive to Las Vegas and get a replacement. But, you know, the shot was worth it. So here's another image where when I'm out in the field and I'm, I'm looking, I'm looking for the flow and I'm looking for um, where can I focus my eye or where can I help the viewer focus on what I'm seeing. So you'll see that little dune in the very center. And there's, a, there's another um, more of a um, hard rock surface mountain behind it that kind of mirrors it. Well, the light is very soft. And I'm thinking, I really need and want that dune to pop. I want that background to kind of go black. I need the sky to, I need a base on the sky to kind of hold me in the frame. And I translate it like this. So when I'm out there, I'm, I've done so much work in post-processing now that I can stand in front of a scene and I can look at it. And I can kind of visualize how I'm going to work the light and the shadows, contrast. Um, what I want in focus and out of focus. I have I, I work strictly in Adobe Lightroom and I don't do any um, changing of skies or backgrounds. I don't focus stack. I, I pretty much what I shoot is 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 what I work with the original file. So this one was at about five in the morning in Argentina. It was uh, that's moonlit. The moon was actually above me, and about an hour and a half later when I was in front of the lake shooting, uh, there was a moon set over Serratore there. But the translation looks like this, and this is the way it felt at 4.35 in the morning. You really didn't see any color. It was just pure nighttime. And I think, I think it translated well. We had some very interesting clouds. So the Dolomites in Italy, this was the raw file, and then I'm going to show you the, the, the post-production, my, my master print file here. And this was one of the first times that I started shooting, you know, um, mountain ranges with motion in the clouds. And I really, this was probably about six, seven years ago, and it started a whole trend for me of shooting mountains with motion in the sky. And, and I've got probably... 20 or 30 images now from around the world that, you know, for me, the, the I, I can't, it's hard to explain, but the dichotomy between how these clouds and rain and things just move through these mountains and the erosion is over millions and millions of years. You try and show this short time frame um, and, and the difference between what happens to these things every day and how they just stand firm. So I'm going to talk a little bit about passion. As I said before, you know, at the end, you could really reverse this. Um, but for me, it, it's a powerful emotion or it's an expression. Um, and I really am trying to do this a lot more in my photography. Um, you know, I still have a long way to go. I'm still evolving every day. But let me share uh, an image I shot a couple months ago in the Alabama Hills. So I was, I was shooting something straight ahead, and then I looked to my left, and I saw this tree, and I saw the highlights just starting to catch the sunlight. And this is the raw file, but when I went in to process it, I really intensified what I thought I was seeing or what, what could be translated into something a little bit more dynamic. And again, this is all really dodging and burning. Same thing here, it was minus 10 degrees out um, in Shiprock outside Farmington, New Mexico. Uh, and I, I sat in my car for an hour and a half waiting for the sun to rise. And when I, still, when I was first here, there were no clouds. And I was just sitting there thinking, well, this is a bust. But I sat there for an hour and eventually these clouds came over the top. And really um, added a whole series of... Uh, of just context to shiprock and depth to the image. And when I get into kind of what I think about when I'm out there, I'm going to go through some thought process in a little bit more detail. Okay, so this is the Merced River in, in uh, uh, Yosemite. And 
you know, I, I show this image to people and, and a lot of people don't get it. But this is, this is what I like. This is what I'm passionate about. I love water. I'm a, I'm a passionate fly fisherman. And so for me, just being around water and standing in water and putting my hand down and feeling the chill of water is really important. So I was going up to shoot this whole series of rapids, and I just I just noticed this one rock, and and it was just black against this rushing water, and and so other people may not feel what I feel about this, but that's okay. It's okay to love what you love, and and I'm going to share a little bit more about that in a minute as well. So I I've taken a couple of trips down to Patagonia. And, you know, Fitzroy and Torre de Paine over in Chile are just spectacular places. Um, and this is one of the images I shot when I was out in that 60 mile an hour wind, locking down my camera. And you can see that there are, you know, there's a, the start of lenticular clouds with storms. And they're just magnificent clouds, magnificent mountains. And I had a I had a guide who's climbed all those mountains, so he had you know quite interesting stuff to tell me about them. I'm going to share this image, and I want to share um, kind of the development of this image a little bit. So you'll you'll see it here, and I I love clouds. So there's things that I'm totally passionate about: mountains, water, trees, clouds. I mean, I have been my whole life because they're just so interesting, especially trees in the winter when they're naked. So this image, I was down in Naples, Florida, and I sat here for a good hour and a half shooting this. And I, and I sat there and I shot, and, but I want to show you kind of the evolution. So this was probably the beginning of the storm when I first got my camera set up. And then it evolved into this more vertical version. And then this is the image that I shot that I showed you to start with. And then this is the image probably 20 minutes later as it starts to fall apart. And then it's really starting to open up. The sun's getting brighter. You can see that the whole storm is expanding. And then eventually the whole thunderhead and everything is gone. But it was so much fun to sit there for an hour and just shoot all the, the variations of the storm that I, I, I pretty much just sat out there and smiled to myself for an hour and a half about how cool it was. And that's what's important about being passionate about what you're doing. All right, so I, I had originally written here, do I need to care about what you think? <laughs> and then I changed it to other people. Um, and, and I've come to the um, point in my life and my career of shooting where it doesn't really matter, um, but for me, when I started shooting for myself, I found that it's okay if I'm the only one who likes the image. I still feel like I shoot some images because I want other people to like them. I'm hoping they will like them, but I'm really shooting much, much more for myself every day. Um, I love sharing what I do and how I do it, so let's talk a little bit about that. You know, real quickly, I'm going to share a couple images that, you know, for me, I like them. Other people, if I post this on a social media page, it might get, you know, 100 likes, where my other ones might get 2,500. But I love the complexity of this image where this tree is buried in the woods in the Olympic National Forest. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how it's even alive because it's so covered with everything else. And, and to me, it's mysterious and kind of a unique image. Or I'll go to the Alabama hills and I see this big rock and I see the little plant in front of it. Now, again, I, I don't think it's going to get a huge reaction from all the other people. But for me, it's very uh, intriguing. I think about the rock that's going to live there for millions of years in a row while that plant is going to evaporate in two or three years or maybe within the year. I love the context between the texture of the plant and the texture of the rock, or, or how it's even growing on these solid rock surfaces. So there's lots of things that I like to look at, and, and I'll photograph that I don't share a lot, but I really, really enjoy them. You know, a, a dead tree in Patagonia 
It's just something that, you know, I sit there and I'm, I'm intrigued by it. I'm passionate about trees, so I love shooting them. But I'm intrigued by this, and I can't quite understand the depth of why I think these kinds of things are interesting. You know, or just this, this tree out on Creevecore Mill Row when I'm riding a bike by it or whatever. And then I translate it into this because it's alone. And again, it, it may not be one of my most dynamic images, but to me it's, it's, it's an elegant image that I really enjoy. You know, a Yellowstone National Park, this does not look like Yellowstone National Park. But if you know about all the trees that have been in, on fires there and the, the symmetry of something like this is just really interesting to me. So I'll, I'll shoot a lot of things that, that nobody will ever see, but I really enjoy them just because it makes me feel good. So, you know, I think it's important to be out there shooting things that, you know, you enjoy that you don't really have to... Um, um, necessarily share or care what other people think about. You know, Joshua Tree National Park, I, I went out there and I spent two or three hours just shooting directly into the sun. Um, and I just enjoyed it, which is kind of an anomaly. Most of the time people won't shoot directly into the sun. But with these kinds of structures, I found them extremely interesting. And something that was intriguing to me was really isolating them against this storm and the shape and stuff like that. So I do get out there, I shoot a lot of stuff that doesn't get out into the public or published, but makes me feel good. So when I'm out in the field, um, let me just kind of check my time here. When I'm out in the field, um, there are a few things I like to think about. It, it feels a little weird not having, being able to talk to people while I'm doing this, but... <laughs> um, and, and these are the things that I think about. So I will go out with my camera, and, and when I start to set up a shot, I really think about these kind of elements. I'm not necessarily out there thinking about, um, you know, I, I want to make a pretty picture. I don't think really about the zone system. I don't think about those kinds of things. I, I look at what I consider the range of light, and the range of light can be a long range. It could be a short range. It could be pure black and white. I think about contrast as high contrast, soft contrast, or somewhere in between. Flow of light, which is, you know, for me, the direction. Where is it coming from? Because if I don't know where light's coming from, it's hard for a viewer to understand or get a sense of direction in an image. When I talk about transitions, and I'm going to go through each of these with some images, but when I talk about transitions, I want... I want to see how light is transitioning through the scene. I want to see how a person's eye is transitioning top to bottom, left to right. How are they following the light? Mood. Is it, is it, is there, there's so many different things for mood. It could be very low contrast and soft, soft. It can be high contrast. It can be long shadows that, that travel through the scene. Tension can be different kinds of tension. It can be you know, intense thunderstorms, or it could be, you know, uh, the softness of like that, that um, small plant against a hard rock, and what that's a different kind of tension. Or luminosity, and, and in a lot of my images, you'll see that I, I strive for finding areas where the light has a certain amount of luminosity, not, not luminance, which to me is a little bit closer to the traditional, um, you know, reflective, um, the reflective zone, let's say, of a particular light reflecting off of a, a gray or a black or a white. I, I like to think about luminance as there should be a light that almost glows so that the eye finds it interesting. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the range of light. So here's an example of Mesquite Dunes. Here's the raw file. You can see some of the highlights down here in the in the in the long bright areas there and up along the top right there. And what I did is I looked at those and I'm like I love the flow of the dunes, but the range of light was really just hitting the top and a little bit of sunlight in the background. Well, so I I'll go in and I'll look at how do I expand that range of light and bring out the most that I can find. 
And what I've done here is by, by expanding the range of light and taking the light and shadows, it's also added depth to the image. So now I have that bush that's a lot more focused in the foreground. I have the highlights on it, then shadows, then highlights and shadows, and the eye travels through the scene. But it really kind of only happens by expanding the range of light. So here's another one, and this one is just right across the river in the Cahokia Mounds. Um, I was over there um, the weekend before this, and I thought, well, this place would be kind of interesting in the snow because it's got all these really cool mounds. And I saw this staircase. Well, I went over there, and you can see that the light before sunrise was just blue, and the sensor sees nothing but blue, and it was dark. The sun wasn't up yet. But what I did is I went in, and then I expanded that range of light, and I, and I added a, a whole new, um, from, from light to dark, it gave it direction. I used it to try and, and guide the eye from, from bottom right to upper left so that it looks like the stairs are leading into the light. And that's, that's really working with the range of light within the image. Here's another one from Death Valley. Um, a really great curving dune, but you know, it was very, um, it was very soft light. So I went in and worked the range of light to try and add a little bit more dynamic, uh, range to it and a little bit more intensities, you know, and, and the range of light can be manipulating the highlights and shadows to the point where you can kind of control the flow or you, you know, you can do some that are very soft as well. So I shoot a lot in Missouri Botanical Garden, and, and I just love it. But what I do is I go in, and you're, you're overwhelmed by these, you know, like in the Climatron, if you're from here, if you're not anywhere where you have a big, lush, green environment, and you're overwhelmed by that. But looking for the subtle little details, and then finding that, that subtle range of light, those, those like specular highlights, and then isolating those, I mean, in this one, I can take all the green and I can reduce the range of light down to just some finer points and really use it to create form and shape. Here's another one from uh, Torres de Pain in uh, Chile, where the range of light was very overcast. And, it, and, and if you've seen some of my tutorials, I have a video where I, was, I shot kind of all of the stuff that I previewed and what I was trying to accomplish with this image um, at, at, you know, six, seven in the morning. Uh, and, and next thing I know, I have a couple of people walking down a path talking in the back of the, uh, of the video, but it was kind of fun. Um, but I expanded the range of light here. It was very overcast. I'm just going to go backwards once, I think. I'm going to go backwards. Maybe I'm not going to go backwards. Let me just do this real quick. I want to go backwards. And I want to play this one more time. So you can see that this is very dark. The clouds are coming up over the mountains. And when I talk about expanding the range of light, if you look here, you'll see the base is now soft and white. You'll see that there's detail in the, in the mountains, in the, in the grass on the first kind of berm, and then a little bit of detail in the mountain range, and then there's the white, and then I went back in and brought out the light above the very top of the mountain, and then, you know, from the long exposure, the range of the clouds moving created a whole different dynamic. So the range of light, you know, is very much expanded. Um, this is the Boneyard in Botany Bay in South Carolina, and I, I believe that most of these trees are gone now. Uh, these trees were um, taken out in some of the recent hurricanes. Um, so I got out here, it was high tide, um, and then again, looking at the raw file and then going in to expand that range of light to bring in all the detail that was available. You can see the sun was kind of in the upper left you know, sunrise was over there because I was kind of facing east. And, and so I brought out the detail. I, and when you expand the range of light like this, you really add depth and a lot of ability for the viewer to travel through the scene with you. So it's important to, you know, go from, from what you're seeing and try to translate that at the time you're shooting it 
knowing that you can do this later. And here's one that has very little range of light. I actually shot this with my iPhone while I was teaching a class. I was trying to show somebody that if you can just put your phone here or your camera here and look up at the sky and I shot this and I thought, well, now I have to do a whole series of grasses <laughs> because it was just wonderful. It reminds me of a Japanese painting, but there's, there's almost no expansion of the range of light. It was either a silhouette against the sky, so you had black and you had white and just subtle, subtle grays in there. Um, and, and to me, it was is a wonderful example of a very short range of light that, that still works. Okay, let's talk a little bit about contrast. So here we are in Missouri Botanical Garden again. And, and uh, I look at, I, as I mentioned before, I walk in there and I see all these really dynamic um, plants and shapes and forms. But if I want the shapes and forms to really show up, I have to think about how I'm managing the contrast when I'm in these environments. So I'll go in and I'll dodge and burn to the point where I can isolate enough of the image down so that the eye finds interest. And now I'm really isolating out shape, forms, direction, but I do a lot of that with contrast and, and in post-production with clarity when I'm working in Adobe Lightroom. Cahokia Mounts, this is another shot from here. I was actually laying in the ground on the snow. Um, and again, I, I love this composition of this tree and one of the mounts behind it, but I really like the little knob going up the tree, the little V, creating its own little mount at the same time. So um, I, again, I worked a lot of contrast in this one to try and bring this to life because it was really pretty flat. Here's a Mesquite Dunes abstract from Death Valley. Uh, I shot this one a couple of months ago. And again, you can see the detail. You can see, you can see some of the texture in here and very little texture in the foreground. But when you go and you work it in black and white, you can really, you can really add a lot of contrast. And contrast will then help you again with that range of light and flow and help the eye start to see things that it didn't really pick up in the very beginning. There's the Gateway Arch. Um, I shot this one night and it was um, a clearing storm or clearing fog. And so I went in and I, I, I really used, I think this was about a six, seven second exposure. These clouds were really flying through here. But it was all about adding contrast to this because it was challenging to, to really feel like I could, I could bring anything out. Let me just see if I can do this again for you. So the original raw file was very dark. There's a little bit of light on the tiles. Um, these, they have new lights installed down there that are pretty dynamic, especially when the weather's bad. But then adding contrast to this and dodging and burning and I dodge and burn with contrast and clarity to help bring these things out uh, and, and illuminating the other clouds that were there that I really couldn't see in the original file. Here's Upper Yosemite Falls. And when I first looked at this image, it, it wasn't very exciting to me. I was really trying to get in on the water. But until I started playing with the contrast and got the eye to focus on the water and that what what I would call either a snow cone or snow, um, it really didn't work very well. So now it's starting to work a little better because I can see how that snow cone was built. I'm, I'm seeing the, the, the veils in the water. I'm seeing the texture on the, on the rock wall now. And I've isolated by making a few other things dark by burning. And it's really starting to help the image. Let's talk a little bit about flow. So here's another one from Mesquite Dunes. And when you first look at this image, if you look at it, it's a little hard to tell where the light's coming from. And, and so I can see a little bit of flow um, right here on that dune, this dune here, and I can tell this one's in shadow a little bit. But if I can add some flow and direction from where the light's coming from, you'll see that in the upper left, there was actually light hitting some of those dunes back there, so now I know which direction it's coming from. And I used the, the, the dodging and burning to create 
um, a, a layer here, 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 and here to start showing where the light's coming from, what's in, what's in light, and what's in, in shadow. So I start looking for the flow as well as working the contrast and the range of light. Ramona Falls is a really simple thing, and for anybody who would like to shoot more black and white, just find subjects that are black and white. You'll be done. Nothing to worry about. But this one in particular, I, I hiked up about three miles because the roads were closed, and it was uh, a little too early in the spring, so I had to hike through snow. And uh, I got up there, and I was the only person up there for about four or five hours. But you can tell the light is from the overhead position. It's, you know, it's... The falls is really in the woods and completely surrounded. So the direction of the light, I went back in and I dodged the tops of all of these so that you could tell the light was coming from the top. Uh, Mesquite Dunes again. And here is, it. you can see a little bit of the light coming from the left side. But when I went in to dodge and burned it, burn it, what I did is I worked those highlights much more. So it was really about taking the exposure down on this one to make it dark and then bringing the highlights up so that I could bring the flow and actually start to see the sand wisping off the dunes. And by dodging that sand and let, letting some of the other areas go a little darker, you start to get the feel of the motion and the flow of the light coming from the left. So this one was in broad daylight. Um, I was I actually was shooting this because I was doing a long exposure um, seminar one night or lecture, and I really didn't think anything was going to become of this. But I started to look at it, and I thought, well, okay, I'm going to somehow get that that uh, tower to pop off the blue background. And so I shot a 30 seconds, I shot two minutes. I ended up shooting for eight minutes and had my camera backed up into a little alcove because it was windy out. And I ended up with an image like this. Again, the flow of light is obviously pretty much straight on, but thanks to the clouds, you get a sense of direction. Your eye wants to travel across the scene. And by the way, I climbed that. And I have my name in a little cylinder at the top. So I didn't climb it that time. I climbed it when I was a little younger. All right, so here we are, Monument Valley. You can tell that the light's coming from the left, but what I did here is I looked at the flow and I and I intensified it by opening up the dust from some cars that were coming through here. Highlights along the edge here, highlights down here, there, and then there was a little bit of reflection right here from the um, rock face that was behind me. So I worked the contrast, but I did it in a way that helped me understand where the light was coming from. So I was able to kind of manage the flow and direction for, for the viewer. Okay, let's talk a little bit about transitions. Let me check my time here. How am I doing, Patty? Okay. And, uh, if people want you to talk about your dodging and burning and all that. Okay. Well, I <laughs> I could probably show them. Let's see if we have some extra time here. Um, you mean we have 15 minutes left or 15 minutes for questions? 15 minutes left. Okay. All right. Well, let me go through this. So, transitions. And I'm going to go through this. I'll I'll speed up a little bit. But this is Cook's Meadow. I shot this a couple of months ago when I was out there teaching. And when you look at the raw file here, it looks really uninteresting, just like a silhouette of half tone. But when you go in and you start dodging and burning, um, there was enough light hitting that meadow there and on that oak tree that I was able to create a transition between light. There's a little dark in the very bottom of the of the um, frame and I will go in and I might take a radio filter and I might burn that down or a gradation filter and burn that down just slightly to give the eye a base to stand on. Then I'll go in and I'll dodge the tree and highlight it. Then I'll go in and make sure that the, the shadows have some detail in them that they're not pure black but there's enough interest for the eye to look around 
And then, of course, I've got Half Dome there, and then I've got a Dark Cloud and the top of Half Dome, which are both dark, then light, then a dark blue sky, and then some mixture of clouds. So the eye not only transitions from front to back, but it transitions a little from right to, to left going upward. So it goes up and down, front to back, left to right, or yeah, left right to left as it follows the tree to Half Dome and then up to the sky. And the sky is dark enough at the top where I'll burn that or, or create a slight vignette so that it holds the frame and your eye doesn't travel out. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as I go. This is another one where a transition, I've created a, a holding device within the frame to hold the eye in a particular place. And then the transition is looking through the valley. Sorry, I turned my timer off. Looking through the valley, you'll see the highlight on the rock right in front of me. Then you see the valley, then some dark rocks, then another mountain range that's a little bit darker, then lightness in the, in the, in the uh, sky in the background, and then it fades to dark. So again, the eye is held into this unique shape, and then your eye will travel in a transition through the frame. Uh, Vestahorn in uh, Iceland. This is another one where the transition goes from light well, actually from dark to this little light sky over the mountain reflection. Then you start getting some texture, then another light, and then a little dark base at the mountains, then light, then dark at the top, then light again. So light is, is very much important in creating transitions for the eye through the frame and holding you in there. And again, as I said before, I'll go in and I'll dodge and I'll burn. I'll use adjustment brushes and radio filters and gradations. And I do all this in multiple layers. So there may be, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 different layers all on one layer. So I'll layer them on top. It's not like layers like Photoshop because I do it all in one frame in a non-destructive way. And I can go back and adjust any of them at any time. I hope that helps so people are asking some of those questions. Um, and again, you know, on my YouTube channel, you can see some of this stuff and just go there anytime and it's, and it's free to look at all those. This is, uh, the other one that the intro shot where I came out at 60 miles an hour. Um, I sat behind this rock wall that another photographer had built because apparently he had sat in the same 60 mile an hour wind. <laughs> um, but this was a sunset down in, uh, Patagonia and El Chaten. And, and so we used it, we went, really went in and opened up those mountains. So let me just share this with you one more time. Whoop. Once, twice, go here. And you can see how dark the, the, the land is here in the raw file. But when I went in and dodged and burned, I opened all that up and that creates depth for the eye to travel through in the transition. And then, of course, the river will be the leading line taking you right into the frame, the silhouette of the mountains, then light behind it, then dark sky, then light clouds. And again, transitions for the eye to kind of travel through. I'm going to talk a little bit about mood. Um, this was a shot I did in Alabama Hills just a couple months ago. And this cloud came up, and I just absolutely love this isolated cloud against the, the Alabama Hill, just these jagged peaks that are all over the Alabama Hills. So, you know, to me, it's kind of ethereal. It's, it's, it's like this floating cloud, this mystery of, uh, of light and dark. And so in this one, all I had to do here was take the frame, take the whole image dark, and then just go in with adjustment brush and just lighten the cloud. And everything else just happened with really one or two slight moves. It's, it's like when I was in the dark room, I would have taken a paddle and just dodged the cloud while I was exposing and I would have gotten something similar. And, and for those who are asking, I mean, one of the reasons I dodge and burn so much is because I worked in the dark room for 35 years dodging and burning. Um, so I, I treat Adobe Lightroom the same way I treated the dark room. And here's another one, overcast day. You can kind of see that there's lightness up here in the sky and you've got the lightness on the waterfall at Hug Point. And then going in and dodging and burning it so that you have a little bit of mood, some uh, some interest. Because the eye really doesn't want to, you know, gets lost in all that other stuff if I don't direct it in some way. Or what I think I, I see when I'm taking the picture. I love to share these Missouri Botanical Garden ones. You know, this is a, 
uh, again, a plant. It's it's um, what really interested me was 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 this. To me, it's a different kind of um, mood. It's a different kind of transition. It's an intersection, um, and so the mood here is more emotional than it is, um, you know, dynamic like a storm. It's like they they're just touching each other in such a subtle way. And again, controlling the light by going in here and taking something like this and isolating it down to the most interesting aspect of the image so that the viewer will enjoy what you're seeing. You know, Botany Bay, another isolated tree out here. And it's kind of like, yeah, I'm out here. I'm kind of out here all by myself. But it, it, actually, it's no longer there. Anyway, I love to to frame things to help me, you know, isolate things and to and to kind of keep the mood. See, what kind of a camera do you? Uh, I have a Canon 5DSR. I use a um, a 17 to 40 or a 16 to 40. I can't remember what that wide angle lens is because I barely use it. I shoot 24 to 70, and I have a 100 to 400, which is probably my favorite lens. Um, hold on, I'll just tell you a little bit about this. And then this is uh, the C-Stacks. And again, you can see that it's it's lighter back here. And I was really shooting the long exposure to try and get the, the edge of the beach to kind of turn white. And when I go into Dodge and Burn, I end up with images like this that are more silhouetted. You can Now the light is back there where I anticipated it to be. It was really kind of rainy. And then I did a lot of dodging and burning on the on the water. Keep going, Patty, if you have more questions. Tension. I'm getting the, are you, um, here we go. Are you using a filter to slow the shutter speed? If yes, which one? Uh, so I, I have a Hata M10 system where I can slide the one filter into a, a really neat little holder and then um, I can put the square four inch filters in front of it. And, and a lot of these I will stack a, a 10 stop neutral density and a 6 stop neutral density if I'm shooting the daylight. In the evening it might be a 10 or a 6 stop by themselves. Um, I very rarely if ever use a polarizer. Um, and, and that's it. That just slows down my shutter speed enough to where I get the, the, the motion that I want. Alright, what was this? This was tension, right? So this was a clearing thunderstorm. And when I first looked at the raw file, I really couldn't get the the dynamics of the storm that I was seeing and feeling, but I thought that if I if I took it and I made it darker and moody, you could see the clearing storm. Again, dodging and burning, taking the trees down really dark, just looking for the snow on them. There's another one where when I was driving, it was really intense, but when I got my files back, I'm like, that is just not nearly what I thought I saw. So going in and isolating the tree, making it a little bit more lonely, creating uh, one cloud that is kind of just raining above it. So really working on the, the, um, the mood and the intensity and the tension between the storm and the lone tree. This one I, go ahead. Uh, would you uh, look at a couple of your chats? Um, and we need to, we have about seven or eight more minutes. Um, well, I extended it for 15 minutes if we need to. McCool is somebody who. Uh, I don't know. How do I look at my chat? Uh, go to the bottom of your screen with your cursor, and chat will pop up. Click on chat, and you'll see the question. Yeah, the thing is, is when I have my live demonstration on, I can't see my arrow. Um, so I don't know if I have a chat window or not. Yeah, I when I have my live um, presentation on, I can't get my mouse arrow. Would you be able to demonstrate any of your uh, masking or in seven minutes? No. <laughs> we'll have a whole other. We'll have a whole other. Uh, yeah. So here, here's one with a lot of tension in mesquite dunes and thunderstorms in Death Valley. Um, you can see the tension between the soft dunes, the thundering storm, the flowing. The flowing dunes versus the, you know, the, the, the straight verticals of the sky. 
I will go a little quicker here. Again, a little bit more tension between the, the <laughs> lenticular clouds and the sheer mountains in Patagonia. This one I had a great time. It was blowing 60 miles an hour. I had my 100 to 400 millimeter lens out there and I was laughing because it was so fun to watch these clouds and this these beams of light come flying through. And it was cold. I'm going to go through luminosity really quickly. Again, this is the other thing that I really kind of, and this is the last one in the series of the things that I look at. But when I think about luminosity, I think it's really important because you can see how the light glows behind the mountains. And that's a function of dodging and burning so that you can bring out and create depth again and, and the luminosity. Young Aspens, um, this was a straight black and white conversion, but then isolating the beam of light that was going across the grass into a place where I could take everything else dark focuses the eye and creates the the, the illusion that it's illuminating just these trees. Yosemite, a very backlit situation, but brightening it up and creating enough depth to create luminosity. I, I know this is Sequoia National Park and there's no trees in it. But again, I used a, a long exposure and I only got one exposure for this whole thing before the sun went down and everything went gray. But I used about a 30 second exposure to get these clouds to kind of isolate and, and, and glow a little bit. And one more from Missouri Botanical Garden. You would just look at this leaf, but you wouldn't think that it could look like this, right? How do you illuminate that little piece of light that is there? All right, so what I look for, I'm just going to recap that. I got a little issue there. Looks like I got a font issue or something. Um, the elements of presence, range of light, contrast, flow of light, transitions, mood, tension, luminosity. And then my guiding principles are be passionate, have imagination, and your vision will come. And then I have this one little slide little thing here. Okay, that was fun. Another fun. hair day. Yeah, that's a do. Uh, Anyway, I think I might have gotten one shot. One. One. I'm hoping for one. I'm hoping for one good one. Anyway, onward ho and through the fog, literally. <laughs> okay. So, questions. I can escape here now and probably do chat. Okay. Uh, are you using a lot of vignetting? I use some vignetting in the very beginning. And then I then I back off, and I actually go back in sometimes with the vignette, and I sometimes start filling in what I've vignetted. So I'll build a layer, you know, with a vignette to hold the frame, and then where necessary, if it looks too odd down there in the bottoms and the right and the left, I'll go back and open those areas back up. All right, Patty. Can you tell us how you do the dodging and burning in LR only without layer mask? Yeah, hold on. One second. We definitely need to show the. Can anybody see my screen here? Can they? Yeah. Can you see my screen? Right, let, yes. me, let me go in here, and I'll just pick an image real quick. All right, let's take this one. I'll do a um, virtual copy. I'm going to develop. So if I want to layer on here, and let's see. Fit the screen. I gotta, I'm going to move this real quick. If I want to go in here and I want to layer on, that's got a radial filter here. Let me show you the mask right there. I can darken that, and it's already probably got, so I can darken the sky, but if I don't want to go over the mountains, I'll we use can a... Only see, we can only see a ruler, not a photo. You can only see what? We don't, we're not seeing the light room on your screen. All right, hold on. Only we're, a top ruler. 
Can you see it now? No. Now you can? Yes. Okay, so I put this radio filter right here, and there's the mask for it. So I'm going to turn the mask off real quick. And let's say I wanted to layer that, and there's already one here. There's one here, a big one. Let me show you that right there. Okay, and so I've layered another one on top because the question was how do I do that? And if I want to make this darker, but I don't want to make the mountains darker, I'll just take the brush function. I'm going to move this, go to the erase tool. I can turn the mask back on, change my size here, and I can start erasing the mask out of the clouds. Can you see that? Is it working? Uh -huh. It's clearing. So. Yes. That gives me a whole nother layer, take it out of the clouds, where I just darken the sky then, and not the clouds. So let me turn that off. And now I've got a darker sky with the same clouds. So I can do that multiple times. And I, and I will go in and I will look at, let's say I want to do um, another one on top of that real quick. I'm going to go New. Sorry, it's running a little slow. I've got video recording and everything else. And I want to just, I'm going to double click effect to reset it. And let's say I want to soften the mountain. So you can see that mountain is getting soft. I'm taking the texture out. So now you see that's gotten soft. But if, if I don't want it to, or I want to make it more clarity and texture, I can do that. And then I can go back again and I can look at my mask and not affect this mountain. So I take the, the clarity off that and it stays softer. So there's various ways that you can just keep layering and layering on top. Um, I am going to erase some of those bad boys so I don't ruin my original. But then they're all non-destructive. So I can keep doing that over and over again. You know, or, you know, here's... Here's a really simple one, right? So I'll create a virtual copy. I'm going to reset this. I'll go in and crop it somewhere similar to where I was. Somewhere in here. I'll do a black and white conversion. I'll create that vignette. Now bring it all really dark. I might do another one. Get it. Whoop. I got to invert it. Make it dark. And you can see how it's getting. Then I might go in and do the exact opposite in the middle. Open this up. Add clarity and texture. And I'm starting to get there. And then I can go down into my my um, color bars down here and I can I can start shifting that around to help manage and control that and you can see how I can change the contrast and then again this is super fast and then I'm going to go up here I'm going to close this and I might go in and look at the overall clarity you can see it moving right and the texture I'll look at dehaze a little bit and then I'll go into the tone curve and work my highlights and the darkness and then if I need to get rid of some of the detail around the edges I'll double click effect I'll take my exposure down take my highlights down my whites down and I'll paint around the edges like this to get rid of the distracting things now watch when I do the exposure you can see them coming up and down and I'll just kind of knock some of those things down. Maybe look at my crop. And voila. <laughs> but again, that was really fast, right? So I don't even know how that looks next to my original. Because I did that so fast. Well, Jack, do you use the radial filter as your primary tool for your dodging and burning? Is that your starting point, using the radial filter? Uh, I use a lot of radio, but I start. I, I use probably just as much adjustment brush 
the radial is great for making really big moves you know so and I like to make big moves because with the radial I can overlap let me get rid of this stuff here so I can I can go into any one of these images with a radial there's a develop look at this let's see what we have on here uh, let's see that might be a copy see all these radials yes so you can see that and I'm going to show the mask let me take these off for a second but you'll see I'll do one overall and that one's that one's just for the highlights then there's one in here that's just working these contrast areas in here you can see the contrast sliders over here and highlights and then up here this is going to be pulling the exposure down in this corner this is going to be managing this this, this dark spot here so adding contrast this will be taking the exposures down over here so a variety of things and then I might go back in with brushes and just paint in certain areas you know like Did that you jump into Photoshop? I never use Photoshop really unless I have something that needs to be retouched that's challenging okay Bob I'm gonna to have to get you to stop right now I want to thank everybody for coming today we should have a follow-up uh, tutorial here on um, uh, on this and I, I I do know that you have a video that you want to close with I think don't you no no I'm good I showed my hairdo oh I know I want you I think the one with the child important in oh <laughs> I put a smile on everybody's face all so, right let me find that run. I want to thank everybody for coming today this video and closing Jack thank you for your time and what you're doing and we'll have to have, like, have you check this little child out with the dog I guess. <laughs> It keeps going. This is uh, for all the grandparents. Or you don't have to be grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Everybody for coming, and we'll have Jack back. Okay. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you. See you guys. Bye, Katie. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.